Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening Dhamma. So I wanted to take tonight to to express a sort of appreciation for everyone, for all of our meditation community, for all of you people out there interested in Buddhism. We've taken up study and practice of this incredible, wonderful, marvelous, miraculous set of teachings and practices. And just to remark upon how how special this moment is for all of us, how to remind us one and all of what it's taken for us to get here and how special is this moment. It's like one of those, this is like one of those grand events, like the inauguration of a great monument or some once in a lifetime experience or uh, event. The Buddha said, Gano ma upachaga. Don't let the moment pass you by. That's because this moment is special. It is a moment in time that is of great significance to all of us, has great meaning and great potential if we take advantage of it, if we take this opportunity. If we don't squander our time, if we don't allow ourselves to become distracted and diverted and caught up in the blinding power of defilement, we have great potential in this moment. Even conventionally, before you even talk about the power of now, What it took for us to get here today It's quite impressive The first thing that's special about this moment Is that it's the time of the Buddha This is a time A time when we have the teachings of a, of a fully enlightened Buddha Which for those of you new to the study of Buddhism, it may not seem all that significant, but for those of us who have studied deeply or practiced deeply the teachings of the Buddha, it has a very profound significance. This isn't just some ordinary teaching. Nagama Dhammo, Nigamasa Dhammo. This is not the teaching of, of one village or city or one civilization. This is the Dhamma of the whole world. This is the universal teachings of truth. And they're not always here. 
they're not always available. In fact, the vast majority of time spent in samsara is in situations where there is no Buddha. There are world periods without the arising of a Buddha. Just as there are places where no one has ever heard of the Buddha. Even when the Buddha was alive, at that, if you were born at that time, but you were born in Canada, or if you were born anywhere but India, chances are you'd never hear of, let alone meet the Buddha. But we're born in a time when even Canada has heard of the Buddha's teaching. It has spread and so in a sense we're luckier as Canadians to, to be born today than to have been born 2,500 years ago. 2,500 years ago in Canada wouldn't have been a good place to learn Buddhism. Not that there weren't civilizations here, it's just they weren't Buddhist. You know, it takes a Buddha, it's not something that comes up in a few days and it's not something you get every, you know, every year there's a new Buddha coming out or every generation has its own Buddha. It's not like that. Our Buddha took uh, four asankaya, four uncountable eons it took him, plus another hundred thousand countable eons, great eons. And a sankhya is something you can't count. It's this measure that ironically you can count how many there are. Somehow you can count that there are four asankhya, but you can't count how long an asankhya is. So it must be marked by something. At the end of an asankhya, something changes. I'm not up on all this. I don't quite know. But it's a huge, unfathomable amount of time. And he had to do all sorts of powerful acts and, and sacrifices, giving up his eyes, giving up his life, renouncing the world, renouncing his family, being killed and tortured. Walking through fire to become a Buddha. And so here we have in the time of a very special individual whose teachings have come through the veil of darkness that has kept us confused and unseeing. It's a very rare opportunity. That's the first, the first aspect, the first reason why this is a special moment. The second reason is that, well, not only are we born in the time of the Buddha, but we're also born as humans, right? So there are lots of being, beings around that will never understand the Buddha's teachings. We could have been born quite easily as a deer or a cat, a dog, a mosquito, a worm. Could have been born as many different things. We could have been born as a Brahma and never met with the Buddha because we were lost in the Brahma realms or never had the opportunity to become enlightened. Being born as a human or as an angel is a very rare thing. To just be to just rise up out of the ordinary animal realm is a very rare thing. Right now we think it's quite common because there are seven or eight billion of us. And we could argue that that's due to the goodness of teachings like the Buddha that's allowed us to prosper, but even seven or eight billion isn't all that much. When you compare it to the number of animals, the number of ants and mosquitoes, and 
a number of other beings and the beings in hell that are probably countless the ability to be born as a human being is very rare and we've achieved it we've made it out of the depths of despair and suffering of the animal realms the lower realm third we are in a position to practice the buddha's teaching so there are many people who are caught up there's lots of people who even want to practice buddhism but don't have the opportunity they're caught up in their lives, perhaps they're sick or in debt, maybe they're married and have children and and are in a position with young children where they can't come to practice meditation. Maybe they have a job that doesn't allow them to get away. The life of human beings is a difficult life. I know of people, I've talked to people who are in a place where there is no Buddhism and there's no chance to go to a Buddhist monastery or to learn meditation. It's great now that we have these online courses, we have people coming and doing at least a non-intensive practice, enough to give them courage and give them hope and tide them over while they cultivate the necessary conditions to actually come and do a course. We've had several people who have done that and eventually found a way to come and finish the course here. So the third reason why this is special is we've all come together. Most special for our resident meditators who have done this incredible thing to take time out of an ordinarily busy life and dedicate 20, 30 days straight to just training the mind. The pure, unadulterated goodness. And so, so uh, the third reason is the third reason is that we've got the opportunity, and the fourth reason is that we've actually taken the opportunity. So this is what it means by not letting the moment pass you by. The Buddha said there are many people. You know, there are there are few people in this world who even think to do things like meditation, who are moved by things that they should be moved by. Most people aren't even moved when they think of death, when they think of sickness. They can't understand why we don't just engage and indulge in, in sensual pleasures. They can't understand why one would come here and do a meditation course, would take time out of their lives or try to change their lives, strive to free themselves from craving. When there's so much pleasure to be had out there and they hear about things like old age, sickness, death, they... they look at the anger and the greed and delusion that they're building inside and they aren't threatened by it. They don't feel disturbed by it. There are people like that. If they feel disturbed, they, they ignore it. They don't allow them to be themselves to become moved. Very few are the people who actually discern this precarious state for what it is that at any moment things could change and we could be dumped headlong into suffering for a variety of reasons and in fact will be as life changes very few people actually see the suffering for what it is see how much stress is involved in chasing after the objects of our desires very few people see this but among those people who see these problematic aspects of ordinary life very few are those who actually do something about it so it's worth feeling good about taking time to 
reflect how far we've come and be encouraged by how special this is and how powerful it is. So the real point is that we've come to a position where we can take advantage of all these supportive good uh, good luck that we've had all these good conditions favorable conditions and make this moment into something special And all these supportive conditions come together to allow us. All of them are required just for this one simple act of seeing things clearly. Vipassana. All these things that are there for everyone else, but that they never see. Right under our noses, right, right here in front of us, but that we never see clearly. They're all there, but we can't see them. We don't have the supportive conditions. Well, now we've come together and we have the supportive condition. We have the opportunity to see body as body, feelings as feelings, thoughts as thoughts, emotions as emotions, senses as senses. To see impermanence, to see suffering, to see non-self, to free ourselves from craving and clinging to things that can't possibly satisfy us to strive for liberation and, and a, a state of mind that is unsullied by the ocean or the defilement of samsara. So it's quite a special opportunity that we have, is what I'm trying to say. So I'd like to take this tonight to do a sort of appreciation and to offer this as a sort of dhamma that the most important thing is the moment don't let the moment pass you by there's there's a lot that's gone into this moment this moment in time so care for it care for it the, um, I think in the Misudi Maga it talks about a person who is rocking a baby and in the olden times they would have a, the baby a cradle on a string Maybe even nowadays they do this as well But So you have to pull the string and you have to be very careful to keep the string going Or the baby will wake up Our practice has to be, cult, has to be cared for and Carefully tended to Like a sleeping baby to keep it on kilter No and to keep it online and in line and progressing smoothly and to constantly be cautious and careful like a like a sick person looking after their um their their the pain in their body not that we have to feel sick or we sh it should be sickening or anything but we should think of ourselves like someone who has to take care of something because the potential for suffering so a sick person if they're not careful with how they move their body, they'll, they'll feel great pain. Likewise, a meditator in moving their body, in, in speaking, in, in everything they do, and, and even the, in their thinking. They have to be careful to not go off track or they'll lose, they'll lose their equilibrium, they'll lose their, their direction. Treat this moment with care. It's very valuable, priceless. So there you go. There's the bit of Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for coming out. I'm happy to take questions if there are any.
The reason one cannot be enlightened as a Brahma are in the Brahma realms is that because there one cannot take the force at Dipatana. Why are you planning on going to the Brahma realms? As I understand, yes, some of the Brahma realms uh, one cannot become enlightened. I'm not quite clear why. But I think Mahasi Sayada says it's something about how they aren't able to see impermanence because it's too stable. You know, you have to note curious, curious, wondering, wondering. That wasn't the point of my talk. Such a terrible teacher, no? Won't answer your questions. Well, I did, kind of. It might just be the Arupa Brahma realms that you can't practice because there are certainly Brahma realms where you can practice the Anagami realms. The Arupa Brahma realms are, are like real God states where you're totally out of it, totally entranced with no form. Only mind, I think. Alright, well, if there are no more questions, we'll call it a night. Thank you all for coming out. Wishing you all great practice and great results. <laughs>